Mario Bava was one of the terminally unappreciated directors, uh, to the point where even he felt that nobody knew who he was. Planet of the Vampires, harboring a form of life worse than death. Planet of the Bloodless, creatures who take men's bodies, but attack like vampires. These pictures had blurred titles, and uh, sometimes they were released by really low-rent companies, and they didn't play in uh, most the theaters. They played in uh, junk theaters, and they played on bills with other junk movies. <laughs> and so, you know, it, to, to see a picture like Hatchet for a Honeymoon, uh, you were going to have to go down to the depths to find a picture like that. It had no stars. It had no, uh, the, the distributor was very tiny and it went out of business quite soon. I mean, it, there was just no other place to go uh, to see these pictures. And um, I would say that uh, Mario Bava's theatrical legacy was largely uh, forged in Grindhouse. <laughs> One of the main reasons for going to a grindhouse was that they ran pictures that you couldn't see anywhere else. And um, you just never knew what treasures you were going to be able to find there. And uh, you know, the collected works of Mario Bava and Roger Foreman and, uh, you know, pictures that were um, incredibly bright pink, you know, it completely faded, but still, this was long before video and the internet, you couldn't see anything, you couldn't see these things anywhere unless you saw them here. Uh, and so, it was the uh, destination for me. Well, the, uh, toward the end of the Grindhouse Drive-In era, um, AIP bought the rights to a picture called uh, Bay of Blood, which was released by this pseudonymous company they had called Hallmark, uh, which had released Last House on the Left, and they uh, released Twitch of the Death Nerve, which is probably the all-time greatest title. Um, and this was Mario Baba's Bay of Blood, uh, and it was a, um, an incredibly ingenious slasher movie. <laughs> sort of set the tone for the Friday the 13th movies, which blatantly copied a number of sections of the picture. <laughs> and um, is a, a mordantly funny um, a version of the murder parades. That uh, then followed, and, and, and a number of Barbara's pictures were sort of murder parades, but this one is, I think, the cleverest. <laughs> it's shot with the same garish, um, technicolored, um, colored lighting that he was uh, familiar with, and there's also a lot of naturalistic stuff too. It was a, it was a staple at the uh, at the grindhouses because it was uh, very popular, and um, I'm, I'm not sure whether they revived their vomit bag gag or not with some of the um, engagements. But it, they they did they did cop the um, last house on the left. It's only a movie um, gimmick, and um, it, it played for it played until the, the prints wore out. I mean that was why one of the reasons it was so hard to find prints of that picture afterwards because they, they had just been played to death everywhere and with the green scratches through the whole thing and splices where projectionists had taken out nudity and Grindhouse movies are particularly difficult to find in uncut form and that's largely because they played so many 
dives and had so much dirt done to them. Uh, and I was so surprised to see an, uh, an incredible uh, DVD release of, um, of the Candy Snatchers, which is a, a particularly exemplary drive-in classic, which had pretty much vanished. And, and I, in fact, decided to buy a, a 35 print of it because I just wanted to keep it from disappearing. And of course, as soon as I bought my really beat up, crappy, faded print, it came out on DVD. So that's uh, the perils of film collecting. It's already happened. And it's about to happen again. No! <laughs> Well, one of the tricks was to, if you had a picture like this, you could play regionally. And uh, you could even, there were, there were even such underhanded tactics as taking the same picture, going back into the same territory and changing the title and putting it on a double bill with something else. And now you have a new second feature seemingly, but in fact, it's actually a picture that's already played there. And um, Twitch of the Death Knight was a picture that had several titles, one of which was Last House on the Left, part two. And, um, it, it's not uncommon. Uh, Roger used to do this, Roger Glennon, when the picture didn't make money. Uh, when the cockfighter opened uh, very badly, uh, he uh, did some re-edits and put it out again under a title, Born to Kill, uh, and that didn't work. Then he called it Gambling Man. Uh, then he tried several other titles, but the picture never made any money under any title because it was an art film. But um, Roger would never give up on a picture. He would always change the title if, he, if, he, if there's any way he could possibly wreak some use out of a picture that had failed that he would do it. And sometimes the titles, sometimes the new titles work. And of course the campaigns were lurid and of course the pictures had a lot of different titles. And, they, and confusing titles. I mean, there are zombie pictures that are the, 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 the three titles in common with the same movie, you know, or Zombie 2 is a sequel to something else that isn't zombie at all. It's very hard to keep up with all that stuff. But, um, you know, those were movies that uh, were beyond the pale in Italy and they were beyond the pale here, and that was their appeal, was that at the time that was like the most shocking kind of thing that you could do. Well, come on, I mean, you got a movie where a guy's pulling out somebody's intestines and eating it, it seems to me, that it's kind of hard to do a classy campaign, don't you think? <laughs> well, I... Mario Bravo was extremely influential to me. Uh, I, uh, I would say that he and Foreman were uh, my aesthetic in the, in the early 70s. And when I got a chance to make my first picture, which was a kind of a bumptious, uh, very cheap comedy, uh, I insisted on putting in a whole useless subplot about a masked killer, uh, just so I could do Mario Bravo ripoff shots. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't exactly the right thing for the movie, but I thought, hey, this might be the only movie I ever get to make.